the initiative bridging the gap between education and industry by promoting STEM careers in Europe. Before we start with, the, with our chat, just a few practical, uh, let's say, tips for you. So if you have any technical issues during the chat, if you cannot hear or if you cannot see or if there is any problem, please write to the chat and the host UN, which is Eleni, that is hiding behind that uh, name, she will be able to help you. Also, don't forget that uh, at the end of the chat, we are going to have some time for your questions, so you can start preparing them as you are listening to, to our um, uh, guests, and you can start sharing them in the chat as soon as you want, and I'm going to pick them up. So I'm not going to delay you any longer, so I'm passing on the floor to Stephen. I can hear me. Perfect. Great, great. So let me just switch presentations. So, um, Thank you, Evita, for the introduction. Good evening, everyone. I am Stephen Bezzina, Education Officer uh, for Diversity at the Science Center, uh, which is part of the Ministry for Education and Employment in Malta. Uh, I hold a Master of Science degree in Digital Education from uh, the University of Edinburgh, specializing in game design for learning and assessment. And my research interests include behavioral game design, so basically the psychology underlying uh, how gamers learn and react to games um, and good game designs um, in education. Uh, today I'd like to share with you some thoughts on how good game designs can act as particularly great learning machines. So um, uh, the main points for this presentation are as follows. We will start by looking at some statistics on games and gamers and explore the notion of games as a waste of time. We will then look at learning, if any learning is occurring in games and how this can be transferred to a more formal academic context. And we will finish off by exploring good game designs and how these can act as great learning machines inside our classrooms. Then we will have some time for Q&A at, at the end. So, um, uh, I'd like to start off with some numbers. Five hundred million. Five hundred million is the number of players playing digital games for at least one hour every day. Three billion is the total amount of hours spent per week playing digital games on our planet. And those figures are from 2010. So, um, back in 2010, nine years ago, those were the current figures. Today, nine years later, that 500 million is estimated at more than 2.2 billion gamers. So, in nine years, we have managed to increase that 4.5 times, which is quite fascinating, to be honest. And this is how gamers look like um, uh, at the moment, these pretty recent figures. It is interesting to note that more than half of the population of Europe is today playing some form of digital game. And I think uh, you all agree that we are living in a world of gamers and games, and this has important implications for us as educators. So I need to switch between slides now. So we'll have a look at, at, a, at a video. So consider this really interesting statistic. It was recently published by a researcher at Carnegie Mellon University. 
The average young person today in a country with a strong gamer culture will have spent 10,000 hours playing online games by the age of 21. Now, 10,000 hours is a really interesting number for two reasons. First of all, for children in the United States, 10,080 hours is the exact amount of time you will spend in school from fifth grade to high school graduation if you have perfect attendance. So, uh, I hope this was visible for all. So, uh, that was Jamie Conigill, um, a prominent game designer from the United States. Um, and she's practically saying that for every 10,000 hours that um, students are spending in school, they will be spending 10,000 hours, another 10,000 hours playing video games by the age of 21. So my reaction, my first reaction when I first watched this video clip was, as a teacher nine years ago, because is, this is pretty uh, old by now, um, what a waste of time. What a waste of time. Um, and I think we all agree that the statement games are a waste of time is a pretty common preconceived idea when we talk about or think about the idea of games in general, not just for education. Um, but McGonagall looks at all this from a slightly different angle. Let's have a quick look. So we have an entire parallel track of education going on where young people are learning as much about what it takes to be a good gamer as they're learning about everything else in school. Now some of you have probably read Malcolm Gladwell's new book, Outliers. So you would have heard of his theory of success, the 10,000 hour theory of success. It's based on this great cognitive science research that if we can master 10,000 hours of effortful study at anything by the age of 21, we will be virtuosos at it. We will be as good at whatever we do as the greatest people in the world. Um, and so now what we're looking at is an entire generation of young people who are virtuoso gamers. So the big question is, what exactly are gamers getting so good at? Because if we could figure that out, we would have a virtually unprecedented human resource on our hands. So the big question is, what are gamers getting good at? What are these gamers learning if they are learning anything? And more importantly for us as educators, how can we utilize this potential in education? So for the purpose of teaching, learning and possibly assessment. Um, uh, the statement games are a waste of time, I think is, is rather to be explored as a question. So are games really a waste of time? Are our students, our kids at home, wasting their time when they are playing digital games, video games? And uh, the best way to possibly understand what games are, what gamers do, and what happens inside and during gameplay, um, is to play. Um, we can never effectively answer the question, are games a waste of time? or the question posed by McGonagall in her videos, if you never experience games firsthand. So, I'd like you to think about your own experience of gameplay. Um, on the screen, there's this Atari Pac-Man logo. I think um, Pac-Man is probably um, one of the few games that everyone on this planet has played. For those who have no idea what Pac-Man is, this is a short clip about Pac-Man. So I think that was pretty enough to, to remember what the game was and actually is. Let me go back to the presentation.
So um, I would like to think, I would like you to think of your own experiences of, of gameplay, uh, particularly if you have played Pac-Man, for example. Um, uh, and I'd like you to have a look at this, this screen over here. This is my whiteboard screen back when I was teaching in school. And these are the uh, scores obtained by some of my students whilst they were playing Pac-Man during the breaks for a short period of time. Uh, it was 20 minutes, 20 minute period of time, 20 minute period. And um, this was a little experiment that I was doing um, because I wanted to see how students, these were particularly challenging behavior, they had particularly challenging behavior and they were academically less able when compared to their peers, how these students react um, to gaming. Although I was more likely to be familiar with this game, I thought that these kids would have never heard of Pac-Man, let alone level up in such a game. Um, as you can see, um, four out of five, yeah, it's four out of five students managed to obtain more than 10,000 scores in the game in a very short period of time. So students who have never played Pac-Man before still managed to obtain these scores. I think this brings us to a one important conclusion. Students, irrespective of their academic background, were learning something. They were learning valuable skills that could be even transferred from one game to another. I think as educators, uh, we can appreciate that this is not common in our everyday classroom especially with students who are less academically able. Um, so we are saying that students are learning valuable skills, um, even in a game like Pac-Man. So we could potentially argue that these um, valuable skills can be practiced in all good game designs. I think the first skill that everyone would agree with is the eye-hand coordination. I can assure you that it is not something that one learns by simply looking at someone playing a game. And uh, it is something that one has to experience inside the game in order to learn the skill. Um, I have seen lots of students, but I have never improved by simply looking at the game. Um, uh, I have this short story about one particular student of mine. When I was looking at this student with severe behavioral difficulties, I must say, um, I noticed that he was stationary in one corner of the maze. And when I told him, listen, you are going to get eaten up if you stay there, he said no. He said no. The pink ghost, um, which by the way is called Pinky, even the ghosts have, name, have names, um, uh, he will never, the ghost will never travel as far as where I'm found. And I said, hmm, how, how can it be? How can that be? So this particular student had observed what was happening inside the game and induced a set of uh, rules, which later, after researching a bit around Pac-Man, I found were correct. So for instance, the algorithm powering Pac-Man allows for different speeds of the ghosts and Pac-Man inside the world, um, but in different parts of the maze. So this student, this is something, by the way, this is something which is not found in any, in any um, uh, instruction manual which comes with the game. Uh, it is also a very well-known fact that gamers do not read instruction manuals. So this is not something that the student might have read or came across, come across anywhere, anywhere on the internet, for example. Um, uh, but when I researched a bit, um, I found that this is true because this algorithm wouldn't allow all possible movements in all possible directions. So one must appreciate the fact that for obtaining these high scores in Pac-Man, one needs to be very attentive to every detail and parallel process every element that is in the game, even more when these elements are interacting with one another. Finally, um, the interaction between the different elements cannot be understood individually in the sense that one has to integrate all these elements into one coherent whole to effectively reach these high scores. So the 
story from this student of mine gives us a very important detail about games and gamers. The student managed to observe what was happening inside the game world. He managed to devise a set of rules for the behavior of the different elements and then deduct and proceed to play accordingly. So I think, I think in, in, in a nutshell, what gamers are doing inside the game world is they are transforming randomness into order through valuable skills, uh, which we have mentioned a couple of them in, on the slide. And I think this is one of the strongest points in favor of games in education. Um, as educators, we must maximize on this potential in games and in what we call game-based or game-informed opportunities for teaching and learning. So, to recap, um, we have seen that students are capable of transferring skills from one game to another. So these games, who have never played Pac-Man before, managed to obtain these high scores. This means that they were capable of transferring the skills from one game to another. Even if the game has nothing to do or is of different genre than the other games. One might ask, how, can, how come they are not showing such skills inside our classrooms? And the reason is very, very simple, actually. The transfer which occurs between games is not occurring automatically between a game and other domains of knowledge, like academia or STEM education. We can cater for this by actually introducing games into our classroom. It could be commercial games, like the famous games, World of Warcraft, and make these subject of discussion. These games are the ones which are very popular with our students. However, I think it is a much more practical and logical option for us, especially for those of us who are not gamers, and in the context of education, is to include games which are particularly designed not for entertainment purposes, but for learning purposes. Sometimes these games are termed serious games, um, and the more main objective, as I'm saying, is not entertainment. It is more to um, learn, to teach, to assess students in, in an educational context. The next slide, this slide over here, shows a number of games for learning in STEM. Um, I'll go quickly through each game. Um, so the first one on the left hand uh, at the top, Folded, is a biology and chemistry game. It's, it's on the theme of proteins and AIDS and cancer. It's a, a, a short note on, on Folded, a side note actually. Um, gamers playing Folded have managed to solve a riddle on HIV, um, on, on an HIV enzyme within three weeks, something which the real world scientists uh, and researchers were working on for more than 10 years. So it's incredible how this communal uh, and this community of practice around games um, can help research, real world research at the end. Hakitsu is a coding game. It is basically a 3D Bo uh, robot fighting game where the player moves the robot using JavaScript. Um, of course, something like this would be an ideal introduction to this programming language. In uh, Nanocrafter, one uses the DNA to build simple computer circuits. Radix uh, is an MMOG. It's a massive multiplayer online game. Uh, and it covers themes in biology and mathematics, genetics, ecosystems, evolution, algebra, geometry. And um, Electric Box World is a puzzle game. It's a physics puzzle game. It, it, it focuses on, on electricity and energy. Uh, basically, you have an, an interactive circuit board where you need to um, uh, make the current or let the current flow from the source to the target. And finally, Virgin Box. Virgin Box is a very important game for game-based learning. It's a highly acclaimed game in the, in the 
field of games for education. It is aimed at five to eight year olds, this one in particular, who can start solving equations um, in the game. Um, I can see one question popping up in the chat. Yes, some of them are, are for free, like electric box squared, um, folded, but some uh, require a yearly subscription, for example, Dragon Box. But for educators, there are uh, licenses which, which uh, I think they offer an extended free trial for educational purposes. But of course, there are quite a number of games for different subjects which, which are free. Some of them require a subscription. As, as, I'm, as I'm saying. So, um, what makes good game designs great learning machines, I must say. In the next few slides, um, I'll be looking at some game design elements which support and enhance learning in, my opinion, fantastic ways. So, let's start with the first first element. The first element is the idea and the use of fish tanks in game designs. So basically a fish tank is a simplified system of a much more complex world. The first levels in games are what we call fish tanks, whereas the player faces key variables and interactions, and these variables and interactions wouldn't be possibly understood if they were to be immediately presented within a much more complex system. So these first levels serve as an introduction, as sort of a tutorial for the interactions and the key elements that will be presented in the game later on. Otherwise, without the use of fish tanks in good game designs, it can be very difficult for newcomers to understand the game as a whole system. So this is the first element which makes games particularly re relevant for educational context. Uh, for, for example, the idea of scaffolding, starting from easier to more difficult tasks progressively and gradually. The second point is the idea of a bottom-up, well-ordered environment. The challenges or problems in games are well-ordered. Well uh, in particular, early problems, and this builds upon the idea of fish tanks, are designed to lead players to form good guesses about how to proceed when they face harder problems later on in the game. In this sense, earlier parts of the game are always forward-looking to later, more difficult parts. This is like having a ladder of challenges which makes the game feel pleasantly frustrating. And this sense of pleasant frustration is what keeps gamers going on, ultimately. It's the idea of flow. It's the idea of being immersed in the game. Um, uh, the required skills, skills for gamers pertaining to this pleasant frustration, the idea of flow, the idea of immersiveness, is what gives the players the chance to progress in the game because their skills are on the outer periphery but still within one's regime of competence very much in line with Vygotsky's zone of proximal development if you recall what the ZPD is so the required skill are on the outer side but still within one's capabilities and this is one of the elements that makes games very important and very relevant for teaching, learning, and assessment. The next slide is situated meaning. What is situated meaning? It is the idea that meaning of the different components is situated in the actions of the components and of the gamers themselves. So the instructions that the games offer make little sense if one, if one tries to read them before having actually played the game or without playing the game. All, one, all that one gets is lost, it's lots of words and maybe you can get even lost in these words which are quite often confusing and which quite often have general meanings and which eventually 
are quickly forgotten without actually playing the game. So during and after playing the game, these instructions are clear and logical because meaning is situated in the game world, in the game elements, in the actions within the game, in uh, the action in context, in what we call the action in context. So that is the idea of situated meaning. Um, another very important point uh, for education in the sense that the actions are in a context. They are not decontextualized, but are occurring in a context. The next crucial, I'd say, idea that is of extreme importance for games in teaching and learning is the idea of feedback. We know what feedback is. We offer feedback all the time to our students. Feedback is information on um, uh, the progress the students are, are having and on the information on the data that we gather from the teaching and learning activities that are occurring. In games, feedback plays a vital role. Um, uh, in Pac-Man, for instance, it is super important as it is in all, in all games. Immediate verbal performance feedback is given at all levels in all games and multiple level goals exist in the form of quite often score keeping you have a score you have speeded responses for example the faster you are the better scores you get and as we have said and this pertains also to the other um, uh, elements that we are describing in this section this is a tangible sign of progress for the player. So feedback gives tangible rewards, tangible feedback, tangible information on what is happening inside the game world. An interesting aspect of feedback in games is that the verbal information existing in the games can be presented either on demand, for example, we have information which is hidden and can be skipped, so that is information and feedback on demand, but also just in time. For example, you are playing a game, you are stuck in a particular place, but when you hover over um, um, a particular um, element or a particular instance inside the game world, you are given information about the available components or hints. So that is um, information which is just in time. So feedback generally in games has to uh, offers two different um, possibilities. It's offered on two different levels, either on demand and uh, just in time. And it is, this is extremely important for our gamers inside games for teaching and learning because this information serves more than, more than feedback, serves as feed forward in the sense that this information guides the actions of the players inside the game world, the future actions of the, of the players inside the game world. And speaking of games, of course, we cannot not mention progress. The tangible progress that gamers experience inside the world, um, unfortunately, it's, it's, not always, it's not always the case that this progress is, is offered in multiple ways in the sense that some games, and I would steer away from using these kind of games, offer a linear or unique trajectory um, inside the game world, both inside one particular level and even from one level to another, to, 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 the, to the next one. In fact, each level, uh, some games offer, uh, offer levels which have the single victory state option, which I don't particularly like because this lack of customization does not allow for different styles of learning and play. And in my opinion and experience, it limits individual achievement. So we must uh, look for games, especially when we are using games in an educational context, which offer different ways to progress so that we allow for different styles of play inside the game world. 
And the next point is adaptivity. Adaptivity is um, another important element with, with the emergence of technologies like artificial intelligence, which are being increasingly used uh, for gaming purposes inside Gameverse whilst, whilst building, designing and developing games. Um, adaptivity plays major and more important roles every day. I would steer away from games which do not offer an adaptive component. So those games which um, um, have an overall fixed level of difficulty. So we find these games which are either easy or difficult. Uh, there's nothing in between. They do not offer adaptive levels. Adaptivity is not something which is built in the, the game design. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, steer away from these games. Do not choose games which do not adjust to the skills of the individual, of the individual players or no randomness occurs. So every game is a copy and paste of uh, the experience which the different students um, have inside the game world. This uh, lack of, of adaptivity could eventually lead the player to memorize staged sequences rather than to, um, uh, uh, to, to try to solve creatively the different levels inside inside particular game. This could consequently discourage thinking and uh, reflection. Hence, um, students would attempt to memorize the different answers uh, when attempting to solving, for example, uh, puzzle games. So this, this reduces the element of creativity and creative thinking and uh, the idea of having students um, using and practicing 21st century skills. Um, the last point is the idea of failure. And uh, in games, um, players need to fail. This highly contrasts with what is happening in schools. Failure is quite often seen, seen, seen as a bad thing, as something to avoid. But in games, every time that a player is failing, he or she is getting closer to the goal of the game. In reality, what is happening inside games is that players are learning to fail better each time. And this is something that we must encourage. Students in games are constantly trying out their cognitive abilities, their competences, their skills, and they need to fail whilst trying out these um, abilities, their skills, because that is the only way they can achieve and master success inside good game designs. So yeah, learning to fail better is something that is not only happening in games, but it is something that I think we must use more often inside the classroom. So we must celebrate failure because failure is indeed a sign of progress and will eventually lead to success. So these, these were some important points that we um, find in good game designs and what these are the points which make games especially important for learning purposes. The next slides uh, are about how to go about implementing game-based learning in the classroom or how to use games for teaching, learning and assessment in our in our in our own context. Um, the first question that I get is, is it just about playing games? No, definitely not. The idea of just playing a game as being game-based learning is absolutely erroneous and it would lead to, um, to um, I, I think it's, it's a catastrophe in the sense that it would not lead to learning given the idea that the transfer of skills from games to 
um, other domains of life like education and academia uh, is not automatic. So let's start with what a game-based learning, uh, game -based learning is. I like to use the idea that game-based learning is a package. Indeed, it's about constructing a learning package that surrounds a game and gameplay. And you might say, so what is inside um, a game-based learning package? Um, I think there are three important elements in a game-based learning package. It's about an introduction, a solid, short introduction, the actual playing of the game, and the most important part, it's the debriefing. It's what links and makes the transfer of knowledge between uh, the game and the formal academic context possible. So um, why do we need all this? It, it, we need all this for one simple reason. It's all about the transfer of knowledge and skills. Research is quite clear in this sense, and um, it says that transfer of knowledge between games and other domains of life is far from automatic. So we need a significant and reflective and conscious practice, I'd say, to mobilize this information. So this is a very important, um, very important concept for game-based learning, and it is the basis for having a game-based learning package rather than single uh, gameplay sessions with our students. So let's go quickly through each um, uh, quickly through each um, element that makes up this game-based learning package. So the introduction. The introduction should be brief. The introduction should be to the point. Remember that gamers do not read manuals. You should just explain the purpose of the activity and give some basic information, especially for those students who are not gamers. There are students who do not play games, who are not comfortable with technology, and these students would need some form of direction and help, even during the gameplay session itself. Then uh, comes the best part. It's the time to leave uh, our students become the superheroes that save the world from the next meltdown or that conquer islands and build entire communities. It depends on what the game has to offer. So it's the time to leave our students be creative, be innovative, and make, uh, exactly, as you say, enjoy learning. Um, then comes the most important part, the debriefing activity. Um, this is, I think, the most important and the most interesting for us educators. The debriefing activity is, is, is especially, it has to be especially designed to, to link the game to the academic content in order to facilitate the transfer of knowledge and skills, as I have said a number of times. I will go through three simple debriefing activities. Um, the first one is the talk aloud walkthrough. Um, basically, it's the idea of having one student play the game in front of the whole class after actually the whole class playing the games uh, in groups or individually. I prefer having collaborative gameplay rather than the individual gameplay, so I suggest having our students play in twos rather than individually. Um, then we have this, this uh, talk aloud walkthrough. It's one possible debriefing path that you can take inside uh, your own classrooms. So you have one student which goes out on the interactive whiteboard or on the uh, screen on the projector and plays the game in front of the whole class. Whilst playing the game, the students has to give reasons uh, for moves, for choices, and you as a teacher, you are the facilitator of the whole class discussion surrounding this um, talk aloud walkthrough. So you should direct the, the discussion inside the class as a constructive criticism of gameplay for this particular student who is... Um, um, 
describing the moves and the choices that he or she is, is doing whilst playing the game. So it is more of a collaborative discussion rather than a, a, a blunt criticism of gameplay. So your role, your job here is to facilitate and coordinate this constructive criticism. Um, and of course, point out the elements which are most important for you as a teacher and for your um, academic content, the one which is part of the learning outcomes for your particular lesson. The second option that I would like to briefly uh, describe is reporting. This report over here on the, on the, on the screen uh, is and looks like a traditional report from a science uh, classroom, an experiment, a physics experiment about uh, electrical energy involving circuits, involving an electric fan, involving a generator. True, but this report is based on this game. So this is Electric Box Squared. It's a free game that you can find uh, easily by googling this, this, this game. It's Electric Box Squared. It's a browser game and it has 40 levels, and it is particularly enjoyable by students stu studying science and early, in their early, early physics years. The only, the only difference between this report and traditional reports is that it is based on this, this game. It's a, it's a puzzle game, and the reporting is basically um, a narration of the experience of gameplay inside this particular game. So the students move in and out of the game to think about and write about the decisions they are uh, making inside the game world. So as you can see, it's very important that a game-based learning package does not simply uh, involve students remaining inside the game world, but you mobilize this information by going in and outside of the game world by, for instance, using this reporting technique. And this is, of course, true for all games because students can report their experience of gameplay by narrating, by writing about, and some of them do it in quite creative uh, ways, uh, their, their own experience inside, inside the game world. Another option um, is uh, for the briefing is the create and share option and this is quite interesting some games apart from allowing players to play the game they allow them to create particular levels of gameplay and share particular levels of gameplay this particular game is launch ball it's another free game it's about science it has different levels uh, on light, on motion, on energy, but it also offers a create and share option where basically um, uh, such games allow players to design game levels that can then be shared with their peers. So what I, what I did with my students is as a further debriefing activity, as homework, uh, these students would create a particular level based on the gameplay that they have experienced inside the classroom and then share this level with their peers but they have to accompany this with a solution sheet that they must upload on the VLE for everyone to access after the gameplay session. This is another fantastic way to facilitate the transfer of knowledge and have students work collaboratively and think creatively outside the box about their own work, but also the work of their peers. Um, uh, this is particularly useful for students which are often left to work individually inside their own classroom because it takes collaboration and cooperation at another, at another level. So, this, this, as I, I cannot stress enough the, important, the importance of the debriefing activity. Uh, the, the debriefing activity is crucial, is the most important and significant part of a game-based learning package because 
the transfer of knowledge is not a magic. It, it does not happen automatically. It, 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 is, it has to have um, a significant um, effort from the side of the students. And this has to be significantly uh, facilitated by our own selves as, uh, as educators. So um, I urge you to have a good design for a good game-based learning package, which makes learning fun, interesting, but which also makes um, uh, this transfer of knowledge possible. So I think that is all from my end. Um, uh, these are my contact details. Feel free to, to get in touch, to either write a message via email or Twitter or LinkedIn. And uh, I think, yes, that is all from my end. Now, Evita, we have some time for questions, I guess. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much, Stephen, for the very, very, very interesting presentation. I see the comments in the chat as well. So feel free to ask your questions. We're ready. I see that many people are typing at the same time. <laughs> Stephen, from, from your experience, you have used all these games uh, at, uh, in, in the school environment, in the classroom environment? Yes, I have, not, I have used most of the games. I used to teach um, physics for 13 years, so I have mostly used the games for, for teaching and learning and assessment in physics. But now in my role as education officer at the ministry, I have tried um, various games with different teachers for art, for ethics, for history, for geography. So there, are, there is quite uh, a portfolio of games used for teaching and learning purposes. I see we have more. So are these games? I'm seeing one, 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 one question from Maria. Um, uh, yeah, I think, I think. Um, uh, most of the ones that I have shown in, in the in the uh, slide are free, but there are also other very good ones. I would particularly suggest um, for the paid version of, of Games for Learning Purposes, the platform which is called Teacher Gaming. I think it's teachergaming.com. They have uh, a paid license, uh, a paid subscription, a yearly license, and it offers a remarkable number of games which come complete with lesson plans, assessment activities to complement the games. So um, yes, there are there are two 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 versions, two two types of games, the free ones and the paid versions for the games. Okay, very good. Thank you. Then we have from Nikos a question: which pedagogic theories could apply to GBL situated learning, for example? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think uh, experiential learning and constructivism are two uh, underpinning theories for learning in uh, in uh, in games. Because uh, I cannot see. I mean, I not I cannot see. Games offer a very interesting avenue for learning through experience. It's all about immersiveness. It's all about flow. It's all about being. Uh, it's all about having experience and learning through experience and of course constructs constructivism builds on all these uh, different theories great Thank yes you. Irina, that is the, is the feature gaming store that i was talking about yeah. um so Irina I, I has also a question about another about assessment yeah yes uh, the, the assessment is another very important aspect Lately, we are seeing um, quite a number of games which are specifically designed for assessment purposes in education. Um, it comes to mind, uh, what comes to mind is, for example, Trizium. Um, uh, you can Google Trizium. They have games for art and mathematics, but for higher education institutions mostly. And they are basically 
um, uh, doing games which um, provide particular data points inside the game world, which offer at the back end, which offer educators at the back end um, information on the progress, on the experience of the player inside the game world, and such information can be used as an assessment, a formative assessment of 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 uh, game based learning. So Trizium and I think also teacher gaming has this possibility. So yes, assessment, I think the next big thing in game based learning will be assessment because with the uh, with the advent of artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies, I think assessment will become um, a pillar in, in, in the idea of having games for teaching, learning and assessment. Yeah, I'm seeing an, a comment about gamification. Um, I'd like to point out that we must be particularly um, um, pay attention to the, to the definitions here. Gamification is not game-based learning. So game-based learning is uh, using a game, a physical game, I mean, it, it could be a digital game, but using a game for teaching academic purposes. Then there is the idea of game-informed uh, education. The idea of game-informed education is basically you take the principles found in good game designs and apply them in teaching, learning, and assessment processes without necessarily using the game itself. So, for example, you take the idea of feedback from good game designs and apply it to um, to um, to these processes. Uh, for more information in this regard, I have uh, my own website. It's called GameInformedAssessment.com, which is basically the idea of using good game designs to inform uh, to inform assessment. Game in Formed assessment.com. Um, uh, it's, it's free, it, it is about research, and you have lots of ideas there. Gamification is the use of um, gaming elements in non uh, game contexts. So, the idea of using, for example, rewards, badges in non games contexts, it is quite debatable, especially in education, if gamification. Um, provides the necessary motivation because quite often critiques argue that it offers extrinsic motivation but I think that gamification worked in a purposeful way can also enhance education so yeah we, we must be uh, particularly attentive to definitions so game based game design and gamification but of course there are other other terms like the idea of playful learning. Okay, let's see if we have any more questions. Can these games be used in every grade? No. Uh, games are designed with a particular age group in mind, so I do not suggest using, for example, electric box squared with uh, primary school children because it requires some background. Uh, work in this re in this regard. So um, I, what what I would check is you must check the either the peg rating for the the game itself it's, if it is a commercial game. So peg ratings are very important in that regards. Or else you can try try out the game. And it's very important that you try out the game beforehand in order to sense what the game is about and to have a feel of the age for that game particular game. And of course to see if it relates to what you have in mind as content and syllabi. Uh, any more questions? You're welcome. Any last question? I think they are all writing thank you. Yes. <laughs> thank you, everyone. It's, it's been a pleasure. Okay. Of course, feel free to be in touch if you need anything.
Fantastic. So I think that we are ready to close. So thank you very much, Stephen. It has been really being eye-opening. I have been taking notes as well, and I'm sure that everyone has learned a lot. So very soon we are going to share with you the recording of this webinar and also the slides that we had as well. And uh, also we have a small evaluation for you, so we're going to send that. Uh, via email, but also we might be able to actually put the link in the chat um, as well. Don't forget that we have more chats and webinars coming up, so make sure that you check the STEM Alliance and the Scientix uh, websites for all the information. And with this, once again, many thanks to our um, fantastic guest. Uh, greetings to everyone and uh, have a nice weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye.